The body of the 22-year-old stabbed to death on board this bus was beheaded, mutilated, and cannibalized. Those and other graphic details were shared today in court as the crowd attempted to get a mental health assessment on the accused, Vincent Lee. Joyce Dahlman told the court after the suspect was arrested and searched, police discovered body parts in Lee's pants pockets, what appeared to be an ear, part of a nose, and a portion of a mouth in a white plastic bag. It was a horrifying attack that is being described as one of Canada's worst murders ever. What was supposed to be just a routine bus trip from Edmonton to Winnipeg came to an earth-shattering conclusion just 80 kilometers from its final destination on the night of July 30th, 2008. It was around 10 p.m. when Vince Lee stabbed 22-year-old Tim McLean to death. Witnesses say a man traveling aboard this Greyhound bus repeatedly stabbed and then decapitated his seatmate. We're getting our first look at the man accused of stabbing and beheading a fellow passenger on a Greyhound bus. The case quickly became an international sensation as the disturbing details of the case began to unfold. 40 Alpha 8. Badger is armed with a knife and a pair of scissors and he's defiling the body at the front of the bus as we speak. Soon, all the shocking facts of the murder were known. Lee had not only stabbed McLean to death, but had decapitated him with the cold calm of a robot. He just kept going at the guy. It was like he was a robot, though. He, the guy had, you know, he wasn't screaming at the guy or he wasn't in a rage. It was just very calmly killing the guy. Uh, Badger's at the back of the bus, um, hacking off pieces and eating it. A bus from Edmonton takes about 18 hours to get here to Erickson, Manitoba. Stops here only ever long enough for a couple of people to get on or off. When Vincent Lee's bus arrived on July the 29th, he had a ticket to Winnipeg and then on to Thunder Bay. But when he arrived here in Erickson, for some reason, he decided to stay. God told me to stay in Erickson. I waited on a bench. A pickup truck drove slowly past me. I took out my knife. I didn't know if he was sent to kill me. Erickson is a small town where visitors tend to stand out. 15-year-old Darren Beatty was pumping gas the day Vincent Lee arrived and sat on the bench outside the co-op grocery store, staring into space. Just average guy dressed, just pants and shirt and Neat, neat hair and everything. He didn't dress no. up too fancy, so. And sunglasses. Yeah, and sunglasses. And the next morning, Lee was still on the bench. A note on his laptop said, for sale, $600. I looked at him, looked at the laptop, and I was gonna go, but he kind of got up and uh, said, do I want to buy it? And I said, well, I don't have that much money. And then he said, you know, I said, 60 bucks. <laughs> and then he said, okay. And then I shook his hand on it, and then he won more money for the bag, and I said, that was okay, I'd just take the laptop. It was his only interaction with anyone in Erickson. Unsure whether the voice wanted him to stay or go, Lee made a crucial decision of his own, boarding the next bus through town, Greyhound 1170. Hello, and thanks for joining us. It was an attack so gruesome, it must have seemed unreal. The horrible reality of what one passenger suffered is something witnesses will carry with them for a long time. The bus was on its way from Edmonton to Winnipeg. Just after Portage La Prairie, a passenger ran to the front yelling, Stop! Someone is being stabbed! We warn you, what happened next is very disturbing. Crystal Goldman Singh is on the highway where a murder investigation is now centered. Eric, Crystal? In Manitoba are in shock. They say they simply can't believe that such a horrible crime would take place right here along the Trans-Canada Highway just west of Winnipeg. Good afternoon, everyone. Our top story this hour, new details emerging this afternoon about that brutal murder aboard a Greyhound bus in Manitoba yesterday. Police have laid charges in the crime that has shocked the nation. Our James McDonald is live now with more on this story. And James, what more have we learned today? 
Well, Connie, the RCMP has announced that they have charged uh, 40-year-old Vince Weiguang Lee of Edmonton with second-degree murder in this case. And we now know much more about the victim of this crime, the young man who was stabbed to death and beheaded aboard a Greyhound bus while on his way home to Winnipeg. 22-year-old Tim McLean is being remembered as a happy young man with many friends. He was a carnival worker, had been working in Edmonton, and was riding at the back of the Greyhound bus when witnesses say a passenger sitting next to him stabbed him repeatedly as many as 40 or 50 times. By now, there was a number of RCMP officers on the scene, but they made no attempt to board the bus or to stop Vincent Lee from defiling Tim McLean's remains. They did provide a running radio commentary of what Lee was doing. They called him Badger. Badger appears to be a six foot tall Asian male, with short dark hair, black t-shirt, armed with a knife right now. Badger is armed with a knife and a pair of scissors and he's defiling the body at the front of the bus as we speak. Uh, Zulu Delta 1 at your leisure, could you give me a shout? Okay, uh, Badger's at the back of the bus, um, hacking off pieces and eating it. His face bruised and his legs shackled, 40-year-old Vince Lee made his first appearance in court to face charges that he stabbed and then beheaded his seatmate. It happened aboard this Greyhound bus traveling from Edmonton, Alberta to Winnipeg, Manitoba Wednesday night. Lee was charged with second-degree murder, an indication prosecutors don't believe the attack was premeditated. Right now we're just asking for a, a, that a psychological assessment be done so that uh, we can determine whether he's fit to stand trial or uh, um, if he's suffering from any mental disorders or anything like that. Authorities say Lee has no known criminal record and worked as a carrier for several newspapers in Edmonton, Alberta. One of his employers says he delivered papers until last Monday and then fell off the face of the earth. Today, Lee mumbled a statement. He looked up and softly said to the judge, please kill me. Those chilling words highlight how mental health will be a key factor in this case. RCMP are trying to confirm reports Lee spent four days in an Alberta psychiatric ward. The Crown says the attack and some previous behavior reported by his common law partner point to some bizarre and unusual behavior. Lee lived in Winnipeg for a short time after he came to Canada from China in 2001. He studied English at a university in Winnipeg before moving to Edmonton in 2006. Having uh, stabbed him repeatedly, his instructions were, and his, the voice that he received told him that, you know, you must dismember the body. And he was frantic uh, and fearful that he had to do what he was being instructed to do uh, in order to prevent this evil force uh, from, from re-emerging um, and, 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 and continuing to, or uh, proceeding to kill him. Um, I was just reading a book. All of a sudden I heard a guy screaming. I turned around and the guy sitting right next beside me was standing up and stabbing another guy with a big a Rambo knife, pretty much. It was a big survival knife like this in the throat, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Uh, told everybody to get off the bus. Everybody started to get off the bus. Uh, the guy step, kill step, or still kept stabbing him, and stabbing him. Uh, everybody got off the bus. Me and a trucker that had stopped and the Greyhound driver uh, ran up to the door to, to maybe see if the, the guy was still alive or we could help or something like that. And when we all got up, we seen that the guy was cutting off the guy's head. Uh, he was cutting off the guy's head there. And he saw us. He, he came back to the front of the bus, told the driver to shut the door. Uh, he pressed the button and the door shut, but it didn't shut in time. And the guy was able to get his knife out and take a swipe at us. So we backed off the door. And uh, I ran around the back side of the bus, the bus driver took off, and then we both returned to the front to see what had happened. And he, he hadn't gotten, gotten off the bus. The door was still open. Uh, we shut the bus door that time and shut it. Uh, it was at that point that he came, started walking to the front of the bus, and he had a, the, the head in his hand, and he just looked at us like this and dropped it on the ground, but totally calm. Um, the three of us had uh, weapons from the, the truck, the trucker's truck there, and we just stayed outside while he tried to get out the door. 
telling them, well, stay put, stay put, stay there, don't don't try to come out. Uh, he tried to get the bus working, uh, and the bus driver disabled the bus somehow in the back. I'm not sure how he did it. Uh, it was at that point, I think, that the police showed up and uh, kicked us off, got us to the back, the end of the bus there. How were people reacting? Uh, some people were puking, some people were uh, crying, some people were in shock. Running? Were they screaming? Yeah, everybody was running, screaming off the bus. Like when, when it happened, it, I think I was the first one to to really realize what was going on. and just screamed like, "Stop the bus! Someone's getting stabbed! Everybody, get the hell off!" The people at the front of the bus didn't really understand what was going on, so it was it almost turned into like a trample scene there, and everybody trying to get off the bus. But uh, the guy, he didn't care at all. He wasn't concerned with anybody, but the the guy that he was stabbing. What did the guy look like? Did you get a look at him? The, the, the killer? Yeah. Um, He's either Chinese or native. That's all I can say. Uh, six feet, 200 pounds, he's wearing sunglasses, bald head. Uh, he looked totally calm. He didn't say a word, I don't think, to anybody on the bus. I think he, he got out and had a cigarette with one girl. Um, nothing, just totally calm. The guy that he stabbed was, was listening to his headphones and uh, sleeping. He didn't do anything to provoke the guy. The guy just took a knife out and stabbed him. Started stabbing him like crazy and cut his head off. How are you feeling when you saw all this happening? Uh, I got sick after I saw the head thing. Um, the passengers were put up at a hotel in Brandon, though they say they didn't get much sleep. All they did was keep replaying the gruesome scene in their heads. Well, I was sitting on the bus, and we just got left town of Brandon, and we were watching Zorro, and next thing I know, I hear somebody scream, and I look back, and there's some big guy holding this little fella up against like between the bathroom door and the seat and we, he was moving it kind of looked like a fight but somebody said a knife so we all run off the bus he was getting stabbed so i'm making sure everybody's okay right outside and these other guys are containing the door then they went back on the bus and come off the bus and told everybody to get back because they thought he was coming out his hand come out the door with the knife looked like it was trying to cut there he went back on the bus and then they braced the door and he come back uh standing in the doorway was the head looked at him dropped the head went back and started cutting buddy back up right so i'm at, i they make us leave and go up by the tractor trailer and i'm standing by the tractor trailer and this starting to get dark and the cops are there and uh he, he comes up and he picks the head up and he's waving it in the window i just smoked a cigarette with this man earlier right that the head and he's shaking it back and forth at the window and it's really intense, right? It's sickening. And I understand that they have a preservation of life policy and clearly my son's life was not um, able to be preserved. It was already gone. But how do you sit and watch what he's doing? This individual ate my child's eyes, a third of his heart, and they allowed that to continue. And I'm supposed to be okay with that? I'm not okay with that. I imagine it would be uh, pretty traumatic for uh, the other passengers on the bus. And the way they reacted was uh, uh, extraordinary. The public safety minister had this to say. As bizarre and as tragic as this is, it is extremely rare. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, the, the person uh, is subject to the, the full force of the law. The passengers are on their way back to Winnipeg. One told CBC, he hasn't been able to sleep. He can't close his eyes without reliving what he saw. Mr. Lee, or the former Mr. Lee, I should say, uh, was held not criminally responsible on account of his mental illness. That mental illness has since been treated, and in the expert opinion of his, of his physicians, uh, he is in recovery. Uh, so I don't believe that there's any risk to the public here, um, and I'm taking the lead from his treatment team on that. He'll uh, try his best um, to reintegrate back into society. We know that uh, some of the factors that contribute to recovery from schizophrenia or from any other mental illness uh, are, are more than just medication. Um, he'll need to find adequate housing, employment, uh, social support in his community. All of these things will help uh, to, to ensure that he recovers and thereby ensure that he doesn't reoffend. He will, I, I would predict, 
uh, have ongoing uh, treatment. You don't have to receive a, a court order in order to uh, receive ongoing treatment. So if his psychiatrist, if his treating team feels that there is any risk of harm to himself or to others, they're obligated to report that anyway um, and, and to compel uh, Mr. Leach to receive treatment. So, you know, the, this will be difficult uh, for him, as it is difficult for the victim's uh, families to see him released in this way. Uh, but in Canada, we do believe that um, that, that justice is served uh, here uh, proportionally uh, and that people can and do recover from all kinds of mental illnesses. Mark Hennick is the National Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association. Vince Lee has also lived a decade under the shadow of his own violent acts. Barely seven months after he killed Timothy McLean, a judge ruled that he was not criminally responsible. The correct conclusion was reached. Mr. Lee is a schizophrenic. Mr. Lee had a severe mental disease. He still did it. Whether he was in his right frame of mind or not, he still did the act. Somebody, there was nobody else on that bus holding a knife. Lee remained in a mental facility in Selkirk, but in 2012, he was allowed to go out if he was accompanied. By 2014, that was no longer required, and by 2015, he could visit Winnipeg and apply to live in a group home. Last year, he was granted an absolute discharge by the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board. He no longer requires supervision, and he goes by a new name, Will Baker. The Mountie who first boarded the bus the night of McLean's death never recovered from his shock. Although he had been exposed to many gruesome and frightening scenes over the years, he could not seem to shake those bloody images from his mind. Burdened and overwhelmed by his PTSD, he finally took his life six years after the murder. The trauma became too much, and he could not longer do his job or handle the daily torment of his own private hell. Because Lee was a cooperative patient during his time at Selkirk Mental Health Center in Manitoba, he eventually gained more and more freedom, including the privilege of going outside and having visitors. In an even more shocking development, Lee changed his name to William Baker and was released from the facility and granted full freedom. Although McLean's parents have said they have no words for the grave injustice of this decision, Lee has been living on his own in a Winnipeg apartment since November 2016. How do I feel about Vince Lee slash Will Baker's quest for an absolute discharge with no conditions? I'm very concerned for the safety of the public because there is no legal requirement for this extremely mentally ill individual to treat his illness. Schizophrenia is lifelong and incurable. The psychiatric community states that they cannot predict the future behavior of any individual. The same community claims the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. I believe it's time for all people to take care of each other. I don't believe for one second that Will Baker poses no threat. He will be a risk to public safety for the rest of his life. What if he chooses to stop his medication again? In a nutshell, I don't believe that should be his choice to make anymore.